Welcome to Proven Improbable. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. Today, we have a very special guest joining us to discuss the natural resource base and your portfolio. Joining us today is a legendary investor, philosopher, and best-selling author, the serially successful Mr. Doug Casey. Mr. Casey, welcome to the show, sir. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Maurice. I guess we spoke last year about this time. Yes, sir. A number of speculators are confused and frustrated with the current state of the natural resource space. I hear comments that it just seems to be dragging along. In my experience, strong hands love the current value propositions and the weak hands fold. Our listeners are seeking your wisdom on how to cultivate the mental fortitude that you've had to make you so successful over the years. Take us through for a moment your thought process when sentiment is low. What does Doug Casey, one of the most serially successful speculators, do? Well, the first thing I try to do is watch my own psychology. None of us are immune from emotion. And when I find that I'm getting enthusiastic and bullish uh, about anything, I try to stop myself and uh, look at the other side of the coin. Now, uh, we were speaking momentarily before we started this uh, interview. And you mentioned that at the upcoming Sprott conference, there were 700 or 750 people registered last year. And this year, it sounded like there's only about two thirds that number. Ah, I find this very, indica very indicative. Uh, look, prices of these resource stocks are currently quite low. Uh, people are not talking about the uh, uh, commodities in general or metals in particular. Uh, and the way I see it is that the world situation is more explosive than ever. So I've got to say that I'm, I'm a bull. Well, please provide us with a macro view on the current state of the natural resource base. Well, the last time uh, commodities peaked was way back in 2011, and uh, that's seven years. It's been, uh, in effect, a seven-year bear market. There have been some bounces and some false starts along the way. But um, all this while, the general price level has been getting higher. Inflation is there. Uh, but the prices of all commodities have been going down in dollar terms, and the dollars themselves are worth less. So the longer this goes on, the more bullish... Uh, I have to become. Um, I, I don't know if the markets are going to turn around on next week, next month, uh, but I, I can't believe that it's going to go on yet another year. So this is a time to uh, prudently, and of course, using the word prudent in the same sentence as speculation on natural resources is almost contradictory, but still I'll say it. <laughs> this is the time to really try to, try to accumulate uh, really sound companies with uh, good management, good properties, good financing, uh, and so forth. Now is one of those times. And I, I, I expect, whether it's next year or two years or three years from now, we'll be in the middle of a raging bull market for these things, at which point uh, I hope I can overcome my personal emotions and instead of buying more, sell what I have. But in order to do that, you need to buy at low points, and now is a low point. Is there a catalyst that you have your eye on that will spark the natural resource base? Well, this is a, this is a, a dangerous time. Uh, in the markets, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you've got to remember the analogy that I like to use for the current economic climate. Uh, we entered a gigantic financial hurricane in 2007, and we went through the leading edge of that hurricane in uh, 2008 and 9 and part of 10. 
Now, since then, it's a very big hurricane. We, it's got a very big eye in the storm. But I, I, I expect we're approaching the trailing edge of the hurricane now. And it's going to be much worse and much different and much longer lasting than what happened in 2008 and 9. Uh, why do I say that? Because the governments of the world, not just the U.S. government, but all of the world's governments working in concert, uh, in fact, uh, papered over uh, the problems that uh, came to the fore in 2008. Um, they poured oil on the water, in effect, by creating trillions and trillions of currency units. And that has uh, put uh, the, the general stock market in a bubble. It's put the bond markets in a hyper bubble with zero or even negative interest rates some places in the world. And it's bulled up the real estate market, especially in major cities. Um, now, when we go back into the trailing edge of the storm, what's it gonna be like? They've already reduced interest rates as far as they can go. So they've shot that arrow from their quiver. They've created trillions and trillions of currency units all over the world. Are they gonna do more of that? I guess so. Uh, all of these governments are looking for inflation as if inflation was a good thing. Um, so I think we're headed for something of catastrophic proportions. So the longer that we go on here in the eye of the storm, the more I like it because I like good times more than bad times, but I'm convinced bad times are coming. You know, I like to hear what you're doing to prepare for the bad times, but I have a twofold question here first. How much of an effect is the trade war having on the space? And how is the natural resource space impacted in the long term when first world nations participate in a trade war? The trade war, of course, is something that um, has been set off by Mr. Trump. And I, I, I think I ought to make a brief comment on, on Trump. Uh, in general, uh, I support him. Why? Because he's not a card-carrying member of the deep state, number one. Number two, he's never been in politics before. That's good. Uh, and he's been in business his whole life. Uh, so he tends to think like a business guy, not like a political guy. So uh, I support Trump for those reasons, and I support him for the fact that he's not Hillary and he's not a Democrat because the Democratic Party at this point has, has just jumped the shark. It's, it's turned into a, a cesspool of every bad economic and political idea that you can imagine. And in fact, Trump is rolling back a lot of, a lot of regulations. It's, uh, it's quite amazing. And, and these are all good things. But, and here's the big but, uh, he doesn't have a um, philosophical core. In other words, he's... Um, uh, he, he, he's somebody that has never, I don't think, ever studied economics or history. So he basically does what seems like a good idea at the time instead of acting according to any principles. And I hope, he, I hope his uh, playing chicken with the Chinese and the Europeans doesn't turn into a trade war because uh, the way the human race uh, increases its standard of living and its net wealth is by trading with people that do one thing better, trade with people that do other things better. It's a question of marginal utility. So he's really playing with fire. And the answer to the question is, if it turns into a trade war and, uh, you know, the Chinese are very proud and Trump doesn't want to feel like he's ever going to lose anything, uh, this could be a, a, a genuine catastrophe uh, because of the uh, very fragile state of the world economy. So that's my answer. I, I'm on tenterhooks because it's completely unpredictable what these political types are going to do. I mean, the people that are in governments 
in China and the U.S. and Europe, all over the world. They're not the best and brightest. They're the opposite. They're power seekers. They're busybodies. They're people that actually think they have a right to control other people. So, uh, yeah, I find it very scary. They're capable of anything. You know, it seems to me that uh, Mr. Trump could benefit from one of the presentations that you conduct at Giant Bandari's Capitalism and Morality, and or he should read a book called uh, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Um, you'd reference us going through the storm, the eye at the moment. What are you doing to prepare yourself uh, should the events come to fruition? And, I, and I'm assuming the answer would be precious metals. Am I correct on that, sir? Yes, I am. I mean, I got involved in uh, the cryptocurrencies about a year ago, actually, uh, which was late in the game. Uh, it, it took me a while to understand the value proposition of Bitcoin and its many clones. But uh, they were very, very good to me uh, in the last half of last year until I sold almost all my position in December. So I didn't buy at the bottom, but I, I got lucky and top ticked uh, <laughs> the market. Uh, so I, I'm still involved in them uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, I'm optimistic about the future of them. There, there are 2,000 of them right now, and they're like junior mining stocks. Most of them are, are either frauds or losers, or there's no there there. But uh, I think the area is going to do well, especially as uh, these cryptocurrencies spread to uh, the third world, countries in Africa and uh, South America and Asia, where the currencies are only good within that country. I think that increasingly, uh, and we're talking about two thirds of humanity here, uh, can only save their worthless local currencies, quatches or pulas, uh, uh, things of that nature. Uh, more of these people are going to get involved in Bitcoin and its clones in the future because they're transferable internationally. And you don't have to use one of these bankrupt banks uh, in, in any of these countries. So, yeah, I, I actually like the cryptocurrencies. I'm doing that to answer your question. Uh, I continue to buy uh, gold coins, uh, not so much silver. I own a lot of silver, but it's very bulky, believe it or not. Um, so I continue to buy gold coins. And incidentally, I buy the small gold coins, uh, things like British sovereigns or uh, uh, Swiss and German 10 and 20 mark pieces from the 19th century. And the reason I do that is that... Uh, all of these uh, government's custom services are on the lookout for things that look like one-ounce gold coins. I'm personal experience traveling in Africa and South America, but the small coins look like small change, nickels and dimes, who cares? So I'm just buying the small coins, speculating uh, in junior mining companies, which are very cheap right now. It's number three. Uh, number four, since uh, as big as your economic risks are, are today, I think your political risks are even bigger, uh, I continue to diversify my assets internationally. So those are the four things that I'm doing. Uh, but I, I might say a fifth thing, which is continuing to look for entrepreneurial activities, mm. uh, goods and services that I can supply to the market that uh, people will be willing to pay for because those things are of more benefit to them than than their currency. So uh, that probably sums it up. Well, that's a very interesting uh, perspective there. And, and I personally like divisibility myself. So I was uh, surprised to hear you reference that. I, I think a lot of people get amazed at these 100 ounce bars. And I always say to them, your, your best bet is divisibility. Uh, my personal preference as well is I like tenth of an ounce versus an ounce. I'll do that all day long. But let me ask you this in reference to precious metals before we leave that. Uh, we all have our favorites. Can you tell us what your thoughts are on gold, silver, platinum, and palladium respectively? Yeah, uh, four different elements uh, with 
and four different investment propositions. Um, I continue to favor gold because it's very high unit value. It's widely recognized. You know, out of all the metals, there's 92 elements on the periodic uh, table. Uh, most of them are metals. And in their, in, in, in their pure form, uh, refined, uh, there are only two metals that don't look silverish. In other words, all the metals, iridium, rhodium, platinum, palladium, silver, iron, all of them, when they're refined and, and are pure, they all look kind of silvery. They're hard to tell apart. There are only two that stand out. One is copper, which has a copper color, and gold, which is gold in color. <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of gold, uh, and I continue to buy it. Silver, I think, however, uh, has the, is, is the cheapest of uh, the metals that you can uh, speculate in uh, and the most volatile because it's a small market. Uh, it's worth maybe 10% of what gold is. So uh, as a speculation, uh, I really like silver. Platinum and palladium, uh, this is a bet on technology, number one, and a bet on where they're mined, number two, because unlike gold, most of the gold that's ever been mined is still in existence. It's in storage. It's money. It's an asset. But um, like silver, uh, platinum and palladium are mined and they're used. So the, there's not a huge inventory overhang. So the question is, the supply of those metals comes mostly from Russia and South Africa. But South Africa is a time bomb waiting to go off. Um, that could have a lot to present a lot of problems uh, on the supply side. And on the demand side, yes, they're high tech metals and uh, new uses will continue to be found for them on the one hand. But on the other hand, they're mainly used as catalysts in the automotive industry today. And uh, the world is definitely going to go to, um, to uh, uh, electric cars where they're not going to be needed. So, um, Look, back, back in the 60s, platinums traded for $30, $30 an ounce or less, and it wasn't price controlled the way gold was for the government. So uh, I, I don't want to stick my nose in that game with platinum and palladium. There are bull arguments, there are bear, bear arguments, but as a speculator, I, I don't like to do things unless I can see that the odds are tilted heavily in my favor. And it's a 50-50 bet uh, with uh, those two medals from my point of view, so I'll pass. If I was your son, which would you encourage me to do first? Buy some precious metals or buy some mining companies? Well, the first thing you've got to do is build capital. You've got to have an asset base. And so the first thing is to have the metals themselves. Uh, after you get a, a foundation of capital, uh, at that point, you can start speculating in the mining companies because, you know, they're, it's the most volatile market in the world. And uh, most of these companies dry up and blow away. That's why people like Warren Buffett uh, never touch them because they're just way too risky uh, and and way too volatile to use as a uh, as an asset. That uh, so uh, that's what I do. Okay, so now is an excellent time uh, because the markets are quiet, uh, the metals are low. Now's a good time to build a uh, position in them, physical cash position. And it's an excellent time to uh, start building positions in well-managed, well-capitalized uh, junior mining stocks. This market will turn. They're, they're going to run. And when they do, uh, it could be absolutely explosive. 
You know, I ask that question because I hear this frequently, and I'm pretty sure you've heard this throughout the years. Someone gets excited about the space, and they want to get into the mining companies, and then when they get this multi-bagger, that's when they'll decide to go ahead and get the metals. And I always share with them, from my perspective, I've studied your work, I've studied others that are really successful. They do the opposite, and you just conveyed that. They get the metals first, and then, then they go into the mining companies. So thank you for conveying that. Now you're still an active buyer in precious metals after all these years and you have a big position. Why? Because gold and to a lesser extent silver because it's an industrial metal uh, as well as a monetary metal. Gold is the only financial asset that's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. Very important. Uh, most people are just, uh, their wealth is based on paper. And, and that's very risky uh, in today's world. Uh, but there's another reason I've got to, I've got to uh, draw to your attention. It's that uh, China is on its way up. The Chinese economy is already the size of the U.S. economy, and it's growing much faster. Not that there aren't lots of problems in China. There really are. But still, looking at it over the long run, if we look a generation ahead, China is going to be triple the size of the U.S. economy. That's going to change a lot of things. What they're going to try to do, what they're trying to do is to have the Chinese yuan replace the U.S. dollar as the world's currency. It's going to take a while for that to happen. But in order to speed it up, I believe what they're going to do is they're going to back the yuan with gold. In other words, the yuan is going to become like the U.S. dollar was before 1933, or at least before 1971. And when that happens, you're going to find a lot of people buying gold. So, uh, I guess that's my answer. Well, and conversely, when that does occur, would it not also then send a lot of those Federal Reserve notes back to the U.S.? Yes. Uh, this is a, a huge danger uh, that uh, the U.S. is facing. Our major export for the last generation has been dollars. Over the last generation, uh, the U.S., the major export of the U.S. has been dollars. We ship out dollars, and the nice foreigners ship us in return, Mercedes and Sonys and cocaine and everything else. So at this point, there are tens of trillions of U.S. dollars floating around outside the U.S. In fact, the U.S. dollar is the de facto currency of dozens of countries around the world. And the problem is this. When confidence in the U.S. dollar is lost, those dollars are going to start heading back to the U.S., in other words, other foreigners won't want to take them, but Americans have to take them. And they'll come back to the U.S. in exchange for titles to American companies, titles to American land, and everything else. So it's quite possible for that reason. We've had an artificially high standard of living in the U.S. because of the export of dollars for the last generation or more. But uh, that could uh, go into reverse and we could have a vastly lower standard of living for the next generation. Yes, well, if a lot of our listeners aren't aware, the effects could be duplicitous because you could really just see the prices, not the value, but the prices of things exponentially just grow because all these new currency units are here um, and competing for your purchasing power. Now, <clears throat> as a reminder, we're licensed to buy and sell precious metals through Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments. Uh, so if you have any inquiries, please feel free to contact us. Uh, of the four metals, Mr. Casey, which do you see ready for a breakout? And it doesn't have to be immediately, but of the four, which, ones do you see? which one do you see? Silver is the cheapest and the most volatile of these four metals. So for capital gains, I go for silver, but uh, silver is only worth, what, $16 an ounce in that area. Uh, it, it has pretty low unit value. It's uh, it's, it's rather inconvenient because uh, it takes a, a, 
you know, many, many, many pounds to be worth much money. Now, still, as a speculation, I think it's the place to be. Now, Doug, I'm not alone in conveying this, but I believe you have a crystal ball in which you can see into the future. And if anyone doubts me, I would encourage you to read Mr. Casey's book entitled Crisis Investing, written in 1979. Now, can you share with us, using this crystal ball, what has your interest at the moment in the natural resource space that speculators are not paying enough attention to that may become the next big thing? Uh, what is the next big thing? I've got to draw to your attention, uh, Maurice, that uh, my, uh, one of my other books, Crisis Investing for the Rest of the 90s, is actually a much better book and more recent and more sophisticated. So don't be afraid to look that one up, too. Uh, what's out there that people aren't looking at today? Uh, you know, I think the next 20 years could be breathtaking. Uh, I'm a fan of uh, Ray Kurzweil's thoughts on this. Uh, he wrote a book, which I recommend everybody read, called The Singularity is Near. And uh, essentially, what he's saying is that Moore's Law, which basically posits that computer power doubles uh, and costs have every year to 18 months, um, it's actually underway not just with computers and artificial intelligence, but in robotics, in virtual reality, in genetic engineering, in space exploration, in a number of places. In other words, this is going to be the big thing over the next generation, over the next 20 years. It's the advance of technology. Now, I make the case that ever since uh, biologically modern humans appeared on this planet roughly 200,000 years ago, uh, technology has actually been advancing uh, at the rate of Moore's Law, but not at the current acceleration of Moore's Law. In other words, when people first learned how to make fire or use fire, say 200,000 years ago, uh, maybe there were no further advances for another 50,000 years when they learned, and then they learned to make fire by uh, rubbing sticks together. And then maybe it was another 50,000 years before they learned how to uh, effectively map flint, uh, and then the bow and arrow, and then the this and that. So technology has been accelerating from a very low base, very slowly, for lots and lots of time. But since the end of the last ice age, 10,000 years ago, uh, when agriculture developed and cities started to develop, Things move faster and faster. In other words, look at it this way. Suppose we're standing uh, in a huge uh, sports stadium. And at the bottom of the sports stadium, there's a drop of water. And at first, that drop of water doubles in size. There's two drops. And it takes an hour. And then to double again, it only takes a half an hour the next time. And to double again to get eight drops of water, it takes 15 minutes. Still, as observers, we wouldn't notice it was happening. It would have to double and double and double again. But at this point, the bottom of the stadium is covered with a sheen of water. And if it doubles and doubles and doubles only three or four more times, we're going to be washed away. That's the way exponential growth works. And I think that we're right at that stage right now. So that... Um, as serious as the problems of the world are, a technology is going to overwhelm is going to overwhelm everything over the next 20 years. It's it's the it's the biggest um, black swan. Well, not really a black swan because a black swan is one that you don't even know it exists. But uh, it's the biggest thing that's happening, and it's growing at an exponential rate right now. And uh, it's going to change the whole character of the world. And interestingly, uh, uh, this is happening at the same time as the world's economic and financial foundations 
are uh, withering away, uh, technology is expanding. So I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work out. Maybe science fiction is the best predictor. I'm not sure that's a good answer uh, to, uh, to the question, but I'm just expecting gigantic change. Well, just thank you for sharing the vision that you see in that crystal ball that I think all of us know that you have, uh, so, because you've been on spot on on a number of calls. Let's switch gears here. In our last interview, we discussed the first book of the High Ground series entitled Speculator. And since you've released the second book in the High Ground series entitled Drug Lord, and it appears that the main character, Mr. Charles Knight, he's back at it again. But before we discuss Drug Lord, for someone not familiar with Speculator, tell us about it. Well, uh, what um, my co-author, John Hunt, and I have tried to do is write a series of novels that reforms the unjustly besmirched reputations of highly politically incorrect occupations. So it starts out with Charles, our hero, uh, at age 23. He gets lucky uh, with the mining stock, doesn't have any money, has very little money, but he hits a long ball home run and uh, decides to go off to Africa to investigate this company that's made him all this money. He finds out it's a fraud. He gets involved in a bush war in Africa and uh, so forth. It, it's a hell of a good yarn about uh, adventures in Africa. And it's uh, uh, quite an education in the way in, in, in economics and in the mining business and politics and everything. So that's, um, that's uh, Speculator, the first in the series. Last year, we released the second in the series, Drug Lord, where Charles, after running around the world with the money that he's made from, from uh, the first book, um, he becomes a drug lord, both legal and illegal drugs, FDA regulated and DEA regulated drugs. And uh, we explain the drug business, how you do it, how money's made, how money's moved, uh, and so forth. And um, now, of course, just like in the first book, the government steals most of the money he makes. And now he's a little bit unhappy. So the third book is called Assassin. And it's a, it's a study of um, the uh, occupation of political assassin. Uh, this is a hot potato, obviously, when you talk about uh, political assassination. But what we're looking at, at is the morality of that, uh, the techniques of it, and uh, a revisionist history of famous political assassinations throughout history, and uh, what Charles does with this information. Uh, I'm not going to reveal the, uh, I'm just telling you what it's about, but I'm not going to tell you what Charles does, but I think it's going to be a blockbuster well, uh, yeah, on its way to the fourth book in the series, which is more radical yet. I don't even want to mention that. It's going to scare too many people. <laughs> well, what I want to share with you is please don't, uh, don't share it with us because I'm looking forward to reading it because I'm just in Chapter 4 of Drug Lord. If for anyone that is involved in the natural resource space, Speculator is a must-read. We have it listed under our, our education tab on our website. And when you just learn the nine Ps, you'll discover how Speculator will assist you in your natural resource endeavors. Mr. Casey, what I enjoy about reading your books is that you make a very clear distinction between the virtues of liberty and the vices of government. Uh, so again, it's, it's, it's always fun to read your books, uh, specifically in, in this High Ground series that you're conducting here. For our audience, if you're seeking to purchase the High Ground series books, please visit highgroundseries.com. Let me give you that website again highgroundseries.com. Mr. Casey, before we close, you are one of the featured speakers at the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium, which is being conducted the 17th through the 20th of July in Vancouver, British Columbia. What will you be discussing? Well, everything under the sun, quite frankly, because I'm giving a, uh, a keynote speech, but in addition, I'm on a couple of panels, and uh, I want to be very wide-ranging. So, but at the same time, I want to be practical and uh, give people some specific ideas about what they ought to do with their money. Uh, 
these conferences, like this one we're going to, Maurice, are uh, very important. Uh, they give you an opportunity to hear lots of ideas uh, in a short space of time and talk to the managements of lots of companies, which is very important if you're going to speculate in this area. So um, I urge your listeners to show up, and uh, I look forward to reading them personally. Anybody that would like to meet me, I'll, I'll certainly be there. We'll and see. also, um, I might, oh, I'm sorry, did I cut you off? Oh, yes, sir. Uh let me, I'll just or say something here. Off. No, no, I'll just say something here. Uh, I'll just say something right now. Three, two, one. Well, I look forward to seeing you again, sir. It's always an honor. But, you know, one of the things also, when you attend a conference such as the Natural Resource Symposium, the Sprott uh, Natural Resource Symposium, is the intellectual capital that you also have from fellow investors and the networking you can do. If I may just slightly digress here. So two years ago, I met a gentleman at the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium and uh, in Vancouver. I read your book last year, Speculator, and lo and behold, I think in the interview, you gave a, a charge that stated basically, if you want to become rich, you need to go to Africa. Well, lo and behold, I went to Africa twice last year, and the second trip I went there, uh, there's this gentleman that was with me uh, in Vancouver that I met at the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium. And lo and behold, guess what? He also read Speculator. <laughs> so here we are at a site visit. Um, and we were just discussing your book, and we're living, we're actually being Mr. Charles Knight in some regards. It's just an amazing experience, the networking that you can do and, and the lifelong friends that you also uh, have an opportunity to meet here at the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium. Now, a day after the symposium, on the 21st of July, you will be speaking at Jain Bhandari's Capitalism and Morality. Uh, can you share what the topic will be? Uh, it's a fantastic one-day conference the Giant puts on. Uh, it's about capitalism and morality, exactly what it says it's uh, about. Uh, the people that attend it are, are fantastic. They're motivated. The speakers are all great. And if you're going to Sprott, which you should do, you should definitely stick around one more day and go to Giant's Capitalism and Morality Seminar. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Maurice. Yes, sir. And, and your presentations there are phenomenal. And the difference there is, uh, just for clarification for our audience, so the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium is, is investor-based, and Jain Bhandari's Capitalism Morality is philosophy-based. And I find it intriguing that the serially successful uh, members in the natural resource space tend to have the same philosophical and political views. And I, I don't know if that's just coincidence, but uh, if, is there something you could share with that by chance? Do you notice the, the, the correlation there usually? Well, yeah, there is a correlation. Um, not necessary uh, as a correlation, but very helpful because you've got a lot of, you know, successful speculators like George Soros who are moral cripples, in my opinion. But uh, look, it's very helpful to have a philosophical basis for what you do so that uh, it's very hard to become wealthy if you believe that money is evil or the love of money is the root of all evil, which is actually what the Bible says. You're fighting against yourself if you believe that. So uh, this seminar is to overturn a lot of the uh, false uh, psychological and philosophical and moral beliefs that people have that actually limit them from becoming wealthy. And, and it clears your mind in addition. So uh, very important. Uh, mm, I, I couldn't have said it better. Mr. Casey, last question. What did I forget to ask? Ah, one more thing um, you asked. It's that um, I've, my first book was called The International Man. Uh, subtitled, A Guidebook to Making the Most of Your Personal Freedom and Financial Opportunity Around the World. And I've recently acquired that website from my publisher, Legacy, uh, and uh, we're totally expanding and, and so forth, uh, improving it. So I hope everybody that's listening goes on their computer to internationalman.com and signs up. And every day, I think we're going to send uh, send out something that's really going to be interesting and uh, potentially very profitable. Uh, it's it's gonna, we want to make it into 
one of the most noteworthy websites on the web. So go to internationalman.com and sign up. Maurice, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, they can do so via that website. And last but not least, please visit our website, www.provenimprobable.com, where we interview the most respected names in the natural resource space. You may reach us at contact at provenimprobable.com. Legendary investor and author, Doug Casey, thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. And it's a pleasure having been here with you, Maurice. Thank you. See you in Vancouver, sir. Okay, I'll look forward to it. Thanks. Thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. Remember to like and subscribe for more conversations with the most respected names in the natural resource space. Check out our website at www.provenandprobable.com. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.